Hello and welcome back to our off-grid homestead. It's early in the morning today on a Thursday. It's the first Thursday in August. And today, Nick and I are starting another project, which we're going to track here for you. We've been off-grid and living off the land long enough to know that great things can be accomplished. Um, we also know that it's easy to lose focus and whole years can go by without having done what you meant to do. So we've done some gardening here on our land. Um, some of it's been successful and some of it's been total failures. But today we're beginning to garden in earnest and to turn our three acres of dirt into what we're calling the impossible farm. Why the impossible farm? Well, it's been 100 degrees every day this week, and it hasn't rained since June. We're under snow for four to five months of the year, and on top of that, our slope is north facing. We love our tall trees, but they shade the ground, and the pine needles make it nearly impossible for anything to grow under them. When we first told an acquaintance who was an organic farmer about our plans to be self-sufficient on three acres in the woods, he said to us, that is impossible. We've learned the hard way that he was completely right. It's been very hard for us to grow crops. However, we've been learning, we've been studying, and we still believe that it's possible. If not to grow everything we need, to grow a lot more than we are right now, it's going to take some gumption, some determination, and some work. So we're starting today. So I guess with the, the house livable, we're shifting focus from uh, sort of survival and shelter to growing a little bit of food. So we know that we're probably not ever going to be 100% self-sufficient um, because I don't know that such a thing exists. But um, uh, we do wanna grow food right here on the property. Uh, living in the forest like we do, uh, we have to do a lot of soil building. So that's what this whole composting project is all about. Um, and we decided this year to go ahead and get aggressive about it. So we're setting up uh, a big hot composting uh, project where we um, are going ahead and we're importing some materials. We have uh, organic straw we have horse manure from just down the road. We got some old moldy hay, which is awesome for hot co composting. And we're in talks with some restaurants to get some food scraps as well. Um, we have time between now and next year's uh, planting to really make some awesome rich soil uh, that will produce food like we haven't seen here before. So these compost bins we built pretty much uh, upon arrival. Um, they more or less just served as a waste disposal um, uh, method. There were a couple of times where we really loaded it up intentionally with uh, layers of straw and manure and uh, other greens from around the property. Um, but there were also times where we more or less ignored it and just dumped our food scraps in there. When we got back from our trip this year, uh, we, we had cleaned out the chicken houses and everything and uh, had a lot of great material to go ahead and heat it up. So it takes a little bit of water, it takes um, the right combination of stuff in there, but it's really pretty easy to do. And we are getting temperatures right up into 150 degrees. It's a little cooler now, um, but that means that it's mostly finishing off or it's just dry and we need to water it. So these have been great, um, but it makes no sense at all for us to uh, get all of the pallets that we would need to make something like this. It's not a construction project. 
and as hard for that as hard as that is for me to come to terms with it just isn't a construction project um, I could really distract myself making awesome compost bins but I would rather spend the time making awesome compost One of the strategies that we're using will be very familiar to all students of permaculture as well as all students of common sense. And that's stacking functions or just the idea that any labor should serve more than one purpose. We're trying not to put an extensive amount of labor or money into anything that serves only one function. So that's an interesting thing about the difference between the compost bins that we had before, which were really only for holding compost and for holding compost in one place, and the compost thing that we're doing right now, the compost project that we're doing right now, which actually serves three functions. It is one, building compost for us. It is two, helping to prepare the ground where it is um, to hold a good, good planting in the spring. And three, we've actually set it up precisely along the line of a roadway. We need to help our road become uh, convex instead of concave so that the water will shoot off the sides instead of straight down the middle. So this composting project is actually serving three purposes, whereas the compost bins that we had before only served one. Nick mentioned that old moldy hay, or fresh alfalfa hay for that matter, is really good for setting off compost. And that is my understanding as well. The kids are fine. That's just their game that they're playing. They're jumping off the straw bales. You like it? In fact, in the middle of winter, the first time that we had uh, just enough of a thaw for the snow to melt, a pile of hay that had been under snow for more than a month heated up and melted the snow around it for, for yards wide. So, and it was just a pile of hay. So hay is really good for kicking off hot compost. In fact, I have it one, one other place. Let me show you in my worm bin or what Sadie calls her worm bin over here. This is our kitchen worm bin, but at the moment it's standing in because we have designed a, uh, an outdoor worm bin for the future in our kitchen garden, which will take, it, take us a while to get there. but. Um, this kitchen worm bin is standing in and I'll show you I have I have old alfalfa hay on top and where the old alfalfa hay is touching the surface here it's hot let's see how hot is it maybe 120 degrees but down further then I have a layer of food and then down below the layer of food it cools down again to below 100 so it's comfortable for my worms to survive. If I were to either get this hay completely wet or spread it out throughout the material, it would heat up too much and kill my worms. Um, but sitting on top, it helps to make the composting happen really fast just in that layer while the worms still have a nice place to hang out and eat and reproduce. And incidentally, we don't use our worm castings very much. What we want worms for, especially in bulk, is for the liquid. Especially if you're working with a lot of perennials and you don't want to be dumping the physical dirt of compost on it. Um, compost teas and worm teas are really awesome. So we want lots of worm tea, lots of the liquid that comes when the worms do their job. So for our little hot compost uh, operation here, we're going to use straw. We're gonna use the old moldy hay that we have and we need another nitrogen source. So we are on the hunt uh, for some manure. We're gonna go see a neighbor, see if they have any, um, or food scraps. We're checking with some restaurants to see about food scraps. So that. Excuse me. Excuse me. Thank you. 
So this works out because our neighbor gets some shoveling done and we get what we came for, but it is sweaty work on a 100 degree August day. Well, that was less than two hours round trip, including travel and all the shoveling. My face is red from the exertion. That's not sunburn. Um, now it's time to unload it. We want to grow food. We want to grow as much of our own food as we possibly can um, so that well, for one, we don't have to leave here to go get it. We don't have to leave here to go make money so that we have money to buy it. And so that we know where it comes from. It comes from right here, and we know everything that went into it. Looks like two hours of work. Everything that we're implementing in a large scale today, I have tried out in the small scale during the last month. I mentioned that I've been doing garden experimenting just a few hours at a time, trying not to do anything uh, all the way until I was sure of, of our plan. But if we walk around the property, you'll see all sorts of experiments that I've done literally for the last four years. I think it drives my husband crazy. Maybe it would drive you crazy too, but in my defense, that's where our data comes from. These little half finished, I had an idea projects, give us the information that we need to enact our larger project. So for example, I had a compost pile in straw bales, just as we're doing right now, in the garden last year. Let me show you where it was. So if you look back into old videos, you might even be able to see them. There were straw bales in C-shapes right here, two C-shapes of straw bales. Um, and you can see that over here, this is what the ground looked like before I did that. Completely capped, compact, no way for water to get in. And this is what the ground looks like now. So when I scraped that compost off, and I really did pretty much scrape it, I was able to plant perennials there. So that, that compost batch did two things. It helped the land right here where the compost piles were and it helped the land over here where we where we laid out the compost. The material that came from that location got spread here. I guess the lighting is a little funky but this is a pure compost bed, our own compost. And you can see that I've planted perennial flowers and also a few vegetables. I've also planted in the straw bales now planting cucumbers and squash in August is a terrible idea. Please don't everybody plant cucumbers and squash in August, but I had my own squash and cucumber seeds, so it wasn't a waste, and I was able to um, practice to see if I'm going to be able to plant in straw bales next spring. There's also a spot up here where we're doing hot compost right now. Practicing doing hot compost against a straw bale in this location actually completely motivated by learning and curiosity. I'm just the kind of person who loves to find out what's possible. And that actually is a part of the reason why I'm so engaged with this idea of the impossible farm. I want to know how much we can accomplish. I want to see kind of how we can press those limits. Fortunately, I am not the only person who lives here because with that particular motivation, I would just try things and never actually bring the projects to completion and get that yield that permaculturists are always talking about. But this time we've brought in the project manager of the Fouch family homestead, my husband, Nick, who is motivated by controlling his environment, making things work and basically making things awesome. So that's what's really going to change about gardening on the Fouch homestead this year. It isn't just Esther's fascinations with an amazingly wonderful, fascinating life anymore. We're actually going to get some things done.
I don't feel like any uh, better of a gardener than I did last year or the year before or the year before that, uh, but I feel like I have a plan. So um, we're being intentional about it. We're looking uh, sort of long range and not just what's going to grow right now and let's see some results. Um, we're really trying to set ourselves up to have a place where anything will grow. So. Um, yeah, it feels good to be implementing a plan. Before we could begin our straw bale composting, we had a big pile of slash. That's the branches and stumps and bark and bits of tree that Nick didn't want when he was milling lumber up on the shop level last month. We needed to chip that slash, we put it through our chipper, and then the, the chips that we had at, at the end, I used a wheelbarrow to spread them on our kitchen garden, particularly in an area where we're using the Back to Eden deep wood chip mulch method. Once our space was clear, then we could set out our straw bales in C shapes. I have one straw bale high. The straw bales don't allow very much oxygen to move, so only one straw bale high is a good uh, size to be able to have compost that's getting water and air all the way to the middle. We arranged our straw bales in C shapes going up the hillside. Then I went in with the clippers and I cut down any plant matter, any plants that were inside those C shapes. Then Nick came by with his um, fork and forked the ground just a little bit to aerate the soil in hopes of promoting drainage so that the liquid that uh, seeps out from the bottom of the compost pile will get down into the earth and do wonderful good work to, to heal that soil. Next, we started layering our organic matter. Nick was on the chipper, so he used the chipper to break down even the straw and the hay into little pieces to make it quicker compost and also to make it easier to come back and turn. We did four inches of straw, four inches of moldy hay, and two inches of manure and repeat. On the very top, we put a layer of not chopped straw, which we'll just scrape off each time we turn it. That keeps the flies off of it and is a layer that will not compost. Now we keep it watered and we wait. In about 10 days, we'll come back and turn it and hopefully we'll be able to see um, decay happening, hopefully happening rapidly, turning these organic materials into soil supplement so that we can spread it in our garden and start making garden beds. So out here on our property, we want to grow a bunch of food. Um, but today's project is making a bunch of compost uh, just to build soil to um, support that goal. If we can replicate what has worked in my small test scenario all over this area, we really are going to have a beautiful garden. So I hope you've enjoyed coming along for the first episode of The Impossible Farm. Come back again and check on us. We're going to be moving some animals around and we're going to be checking on this compost to see how it does and building on our three acres of woods, The Impossible Farm. Thanks for hanging out with us. I'm Nick Fouch. Thanks for watching.